Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's in-house exec search webinar. I was saying to um, our panellists um, that have joined us today, it's a little bit strange doing it in the afternoon, as uh, so we normally do it in the morning, but as you may have guessed, um, Simon is, uh, is US-based, so it's um, roughly six o'clock in the morning, so he's had to get up nice and early. It seemed unfair to make him get up any earlier than that. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Natasha Priya Cannon. I am the Managing Director of In-House Recruitment. Uh, the fastest growing community for in-house recruiters, talent acquisition and HR professionals in the UK. So as I said, thank you very much for joining us today and a special welcome to our panellists and our guest speakers that we have. So we have um, Becky and Katie from TFL and we have Simon from ESIX or Essex. Um, I'm, I've been informed you can call it either way, but I'm going to call it ESIX. Um, so um, these guys are also our event partners for this event. So if you don't know who they are, they are a, a corporate network here to help advance best practices in exec recruiting worldwide. They help their members to benchmark best practices, selecting the right search consultants, and also building an interning, internal capability to recruit directly at the exec level. So we will be hearing a little bit more about their sort of benchmarking and results that they've just, uh, just undertaken, um, and we'll be doing that shortly. Before we get started, we, uh, we are going to have um, some Q&A at the end of the session. So if you do have any questions throughout, please do just pop your question in the Q&A box, depending on which sort of setup you've got, either be at the top or the bottom, um, and just type in your question at any point, and we'll be asking all of the questions to all of our speakers at the end of the session at roughly quarter to three. We will also have a couple of polls. Um, there are some sort of open text poll options. So for those responses, please do just put them in the chat function um, and we can have a look at those as well. Do get involved, do let us know any additional insight. If, uh, if anyone has a, a burning desire to also share their insight, then uh, just pop your hand up, which you can literally do um, on, on your uh, profile as well. And we can uh, perhaps come to you at the end if we have enough time. I hope you enjoy the session. I am now going to hand over to Simon. Um, we're gonna do a little technical swap over of slides for you. And um, so we'll just make sure that they're up and running for you. Perfect, excellent. Well, I'll hand over to you, Simon. You can introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit more. I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna mute myself. Oh, you're muted. Perfect. I, I'm muted myself already. There you go. I'll see you guys <laughs> shortly. All right. Super. Well, thank you so much, Natasha. Sorry, Simon. I think I've muted. Uh, I've muted yourself rather than myself. Okay. There we go. There Does that work better? Yes. Perfect. All right, good. So, uh, well, thank you again, Natasha, twice in 10 seconds. All right, so good. And uh, very excited to, uh, to do this. And thank you for the invitation. And as you rightly said, it is quite early in the morning. I usually get uh, daylight, but unfortunately, I don't get daylight at the moment, but that's okay. We'll work with that. So uh, you've mentioned E6, which is super. I'm going to quickly go through an introduction and then talk a little bit about our benchmark survey, which we do every year, have done for, I think, oh, probably 15 years or so. Uh, but I wanted to also quickly highlight what you had said, I believe, in the introduction or the, um, the overview, uh, where we'd be talking a little bit about best-in-class companies and organizations, uh, executive, uh, sorry, some exclusive insights, uh, which is actually true because most of the members haven't even seen these yet. Um, so uh, I'm kind of uh, feeling a bit guilty about that. Uh, but also a little bit about what some of the top performing organizations are doing. And, um, and I'll talk about the top performing too, because top performing is very different depending who you are, of course, and uh, what your organization's culture and challenges and needs are. So, you know, that's a bit of an interesting question. Uh, and I hope uh, that Becky and Katie are gonna talk more about some of the uh, competitive analysis perhaps, and also the succession planning, because they'll know much more than I will. But anyway, so um, we'll move on to, uh, my background, that is my background. I'm not even going to suggest that you try and read that. Uh, so the key points here is uh, basically started off in London, uh, went to Hong Kong, went to Corn Ferry in Boston, Corn Ferry Silicon Valley, joined Microsoft's executive recruiting team, was there for a number of years, also ran a staffing function for them for 
for about 18 months, which was crazy. Uh, and then joined uh, this organization called E6, uh, or Essex to some, uh, now exactly five years ago almost, and uh, very exciting. And we're all about strategic management of this function, corporate executive recruiting, all about corporate executive recruiting. It's actually been around 20, almost 25 years, uh, which is amazing to think. Uh, as I say, I only took over five years ago, but I was involved before for about 10 years uh, and involved with the group on the advisory board and so on. It's all about the practitioners community, uh, developing tools, information between us, best practice sharing and so on. And we're completely independent. So that's, that's a key point uh, that we have no uh, vendor relationships, no search firm sponsorships, no research firm, no software company. Uh, it's all about the members, uh, which is, um, well, which is a lot of fun. So, and here are our members. I don't know if you can see the screen, but if you can, uh, there are a number of organizations here. And, and st strange enough, Transport for London is right in the middle, which is a weird coincidence, but there you go. Maybe even slightly larger than the others. I don't know. But then again, I notice also that, uh, or at least I believe, uh, some other of our members are going to be joining. Uh, so uh, they're also close to the middle too. Um, I'll send you a picture of that, Becky. Don't worry. You can see that later. All right, so, uh, and here are our basic uh, services. Uh, I know it's a little bit like a, a, an advertisement for E6 here, but uh, we have mentioned networking, benchmarking, we have some tools, uh, we have training classes and so on and so forth, uh, as well as our um, career page. It's all about developing the team, building the teams, and those kinds of things. In fact, this is actually our academy online. This, as far as I know, is the only place you can get corporate executive recruiting training classes. And um, there on the left is the, uh, Curriculum on the right is just an example of the web page. So let's get to the bit. Oh, let's not get to that bit yet. So we have a book giveaway. Uh, we have a new book coming out. The founder of executive of uh, E6, sorry, uh, David Lord and myself have written a book. Uh, it is almost complete. Uh, we are uh, literally in the middle of uh, finishing off the final touches, as it were. And it's coming out later this year, which is exciting, very exciting. Uh, as I say, based on 25 years of this group and the academy classes the membership meetings and so on and so forth and uh, benchmark surveys. And we're going to give away three books uh, to uh, the best questions today. Um, now, there are, there are some small print uh, details at the bottom there. Um, so I want to make sure you read those because there is absolutely no fairness whatsoever. It's completely up to Becky, Katie and myself. And uh, there are, of course, no judgments on that. It's completely what we think and how we feel at the time and how much coffee we've drunk, uh, or even tea. Uh, also, uh, the, the decisions are final, and, um, and so on and so forth. And there is a warning at the very bottom of that page, if you can't read it, that you should be very cautious about. Uh, so, moving on, let's go to the actual survey. So the benchmark survey, uh, as I say, it's been going for a long time. Uh, we're only going to give you a, a quick sample of a few uh, data points. This is actually 81 pages worth, uh, and I think we've got more slides to come. So it literally just closed about a week ago for the record. And so um, uh, we are literally uh, producing it at the moment. Uh, so we're going to show you a few ideas, a few thoughts, a few slides, as it were. But actually, uh, as I say, there are a lot more, and you, you wouldn't want to sit through all of them, let me be clear. Uh, we make our members do that, but that's uh, a privilege that they have. 90 organizations responded this year, uh, which was fantastic, uh, considering uh, how many challenges uh, uh, these organizations are going through, including your own, I'm sure. Uh, and most of them, most of those respondents are completely focused and dedicated to corporate executive recruiting. Uh, there are a number of that are also focused or have broader TA roles, um, talent management roles and so on, but they're also including executive recruiting. But the majority of folks, as you can see, almost 90% uh, are dedicated to corporate exec recruiting. Just as a kind of a sampling, in fact, this is also on the next slide, um, just as an idea of who's responding. It's mostly large organizations, not always, but mostly large organizations. So size of organ, employee size, uh, more than 80,000, more than 20,000, and so on and so forth. Um, you can see that basically it's a third, a third, a third on the right-hand side. And uh, if you look at the uh, bottom left-hand side, uh, you can see that, uh, what is it, about 50-something, 60-something plus percent are uh, in sizable organizations. But then again, they're all pretty sizable. So it um, <laughs> uh, just depends what your scale is. Uh, the uh, overview of those who respond again, uh, largest number are in technology or telecom, and also financial services is quite a big chunk. But as you can also see, we've got manufacturing, we've got healthcare, 
uh, media entertainment, small numbers over on the right hand side. Uh, what's great about this is this is a broad selection uh, and also regionally quite broad as well, which is fantastic. So a couple of the highlights that come, come out and really what, what we've drawn on here are uh, really, I mean, as I say, your, your questions that came through thanks to Natasha are quite broad and varied. Uh, so I don't know that we're going to cover all of those. Uh, at the same time, what we've done here is we've kind of covered the pieces that seem to be slightly more striking than others. Uh, we have, I mean, the, the book that comes out is 34 pages long, so um, you can tell we have probably a lot of information that you might want to touch on. But here is a few sampling, as I say, sample examples, as it were. Uh, so this role, the leadership role of this function, uh, we're finding uh, reports to staffing in most cases, uh, or talent acquisition. However, uh, we, we're wondering whether that's changing. And, um, and in fact, more of these roles are gonna start reporting to talent management, talent acquisition hybrid roles, or these roles might report more into kind of succession leadership uh, arenas instead of straight up talent acquisition. Uh, we changed the question uh, just last year to incorporate some of these unusual, or not unusual, but different titles, which is why we don't have 10 years worth of data here. But the general trend before last year was, and which is why we changed the question uh, in that direction. Also, uh, we're finding that uh, it, at least in my opinion, and these two pointers here on the right hand side, uh, I believe, and this is largely projection, uh, that uh, this role is going upstream, as it were, or higher uh, kind of impact level, closer to the CEO. Uh, and also, uh, and these two points of data, uh, do they actually tell us that? It's hard to tell, but um, my belief is that they are. Um, in general, these roles are going higher upstream, as it were, and uh, uh, which is a good thing. Now, the reason this, this slide is up is because uh, the question often comes up, uh, wh who, who are we actually hiring or what does executive recruiting mean to you? And we ask uh, every year pretty much now, does that mean titles and what titles are you hiring for? Does that mean a proportion of the, of the entire organization and what proportion of the organization are you hiring into? You know, 1.5% is often the case uh, or sometimes top 1%. Uh, and we also ask what are the minimum compensations of those people that you're hiring now again industry different regions different uh, so this is a broad swathe as it were of, of uh, information here but what's uh, what's perhaps most striking and uh, which i rather like is that whenever i read articles from the search firms uh, in their various uh, magazines and newspapers they talk about how this function only ever seems to recruit less than two hundred thousand. this is us dollars so less than 200,000. So we're, we're playing at the small end. The low end is uh, kind of the general theme out there in the search firm world, uh, at least when I've read it. Uh, but actually, as you can see, a vast majority of folks are actually hiring way higher than 200,000. And in fact, um, we're seeing perhaps a growth at this end of the, of the graph, as it were, table, I guess it is a graph, um, that, uh, almost 50% of folks are hiring above 350,000 US dollars equivalent. And so it's, um, it's higher end, uh, very much so. Uh, and in fact, you can see also in that other graph that quite a lot of folks are hiring at the million dollars and, and higher level, or even million pounds and higher level. So this is one of those things that excites me, but perhaps because uh, I'm a bit of a geek that way. Um, the uh, general trend in the last four years in terms of source of hire, has been that uh, we're using retained search firms less at our headquarter organizations. The point here is uh, most executive recruiting is done in headquarters. And um, we're finding that uh, retained search firms are being used uh, less time or fewer times. And uh, we're directly sourcing our hires more times. Uh, well, that's probably not entirely surprising. It's a gradual trend, but it's in the right direction in my opinion. Uh, we're not, by the way, advocate, advocating that we do not use search firms at all. We're just advocating uh, a mix which is uh, the right strategic mix for your organization. Um, however, what's perhaps more exciting to me and, and really gets me going is this fact that non-headquarter uh, groups, as it were, so not in your uh, local headquarters, so to speak, are now doing more work direct hiring and less work using retained search firms. Traditionally, historically, everyone not in headquarters usually used to use search firms for international hiring. And uh, that is not the case anymore. In fact, quite obviously so, which is kind of exciting to me. A couple of other little pointers here. Uh, I believe that these are indicators that this 
function is kind of growing up, maturing, and having greater strategic impact in, it, in, in your organization, some of you. I know some of our members are actually on this call, which is great. Uh, a number of folks, 83% uh, are actually responsible for internal talent movement. In fact, we have a panel this week, tomorrow, uh, on how organizations are asking this function to take on a broader uh, remit, as it were, in terms of uh, internal talent movement, internal talent mobility, as well as hiring external talent. So you get a bigger picture of the overall talent, uh, which we'll come back to in a second. Uh, and it's growing significantly in this direction. And when they're doing that around 43, exactly 43% of those hires, when they're doing both of them, are uh, on the internal side. In a similar vein, almost two thirds are providing external talent information to the corporate succession planning process, which is which I think is fantastic and it's probably only gonna go upwards. And when they're doing that, they're hiring, sorry, they're providing things like benchmark data and talent introductions. So having their CEO or their senior executives go out and meet talent before a requisition is opened or a job description is actually even written, but this kind of opportunistically connecting with talent externally. Uh, of course, talent mapping and talent intelligence there are some amazing functions that have some incredible uh, research and talent intelligence teams out there some of whom might be listening. Uh, and also, which I find probably the most exciting out of this page, is that uh, over a quarter of the respondents are actually involved in non-executive director or board member hiring uh, for their organizations. And when they're doing that, 28% are doing those searches using their own teams. Uh, most people are still using search firms, which makes a lot of sense. There is a, a, some very good reasons to do that but uh, a sizable number are also having their own direct hiring teams doing board member hiring or non-executive directors, uh, which is, I find very exciting. So uh, this is a little interesting, interesting trend. Well, again, we've been doing a survey like this for a long time. And uh, 10 years ago, we found that the uh, general respondents were using uh, search, uh, sorry, executive assessment tools or firms uh, less uh, each year for some strange reason down to 2014. And it's something that turned. Now, my belief is that that might be because diversity became a much more higher priority for folks. Uh, unconscious bias is part of that, perhaps using tools to try and bring uh, a more a fairer perspective, I don't know. But um, uh, certainly it's turned and changed. And uh, as you can see, it's now 57, 64 in the last couple of years. And in fact, this year, uh, we're actually at 68% of our respondents are now using some sort of assessment tool. There has been a remarkable proliferation. We've had a variety of organizations coming in, talking to us about various tools, as well as panels, actually, of our members talking to us about the tools and how they've implemented them. Uh, it's, it's a huge deal. Hiring for diversity, of course, is huge and, uh, and the highest priority for our members for a number of years. What this slide is showing uh, is the various tools and tactics. Again, we're giving you a sample of what we've got. We've actually got a full survey on this. We did uh, probably six months ago now. Um, but the, as you can see here, what we've got are tactics uh, for uh, these various teams of tactics and tools and how they're addressing executive recruiting at the, uh, sorry, diverse executive recruiting or hiring for diverse executives and um, tracking flow of data. Uh, every candidate uh, um, Slate, uh, sorry, must have uh, diverse representation is the most prolific or most popular uh, tool used, um, diverse interviewers and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can see that um, people are using a variety of different things to try and address diversity in their leadership ranks. Search firms, of course, uh, will not likely go away and search firm fees are one of those things that we're constantly monitoring. Um, around quarter of all external hires are used, uh, using search firms. Uh, and this is an apples to apples, as we call it, uh, survey. Uh, in as much as this particular one, we study those respondents who gave us data in 2019, and then those respondents who gave us data in 2020, and see how much their spend has increased or reduced or whatever it might be. And as you can see, it's actually reduced. And in fact, that's happened over the last few years consistently. So year on year, as we study this, uh, we're finding that uh, the same respondents are spending less each year. Now, all over those years, not necessarily, we don't have that yet, but um, certainly that's an interesting trend. You can also see that there were those that use search firms are spending a, a smaller amount each time on average in gross amounts. Uh, and they're, But having said that, the average retained search fee has gone up and it has consistently gone up in the last few years. 
uh, in the US, uh, those headquartered companies out of the US, uh, the average spend was slightly less than the total average, but 1.8 million US dollars, which is also down. But again, the average fee is up. And these, by the way, these points of data are somewhat consistent, as you can see. So for some strange reason, US headquartered companies seem to spend less than uh, our survey respondents who are based in, U uh, in uh, UK and Europe. At the same time, they, on average, spend more per search, which is, I don't know why that is, but it just seems to be the case. And uh, data is telling us that last couple of years. Search admin fees. This is, a, again, one of my um, pet peeves, as it were, is what is, is that search admin fee all about? But the key here is that we're finding this is going down slowly, and uh, we will hope to see that disappear. In fact, we'll keep advocating for that those uh, somewhat arbitrary search admin fees that seem to be out there. Generally, uh, search firms, uh, sorry, <laughs> direct teams or in-house teams are on the upswing. Uh, you can see a couple of years ago, 72% of our respondents had some sort of a direct hiring function. Uh, we're now at 79% and so on. And then very, uh, very quickly here, I call this an unfair comparison uh, because this, this, is the, uh, this is the data uh, from the uh, respondents about their search firm uses, if they use search firms, and their own direct teams. And um, as you can probably see here, uh, that uh, when we are measuring time to fill, we are, as an in-house team, usually faster than the search firms. Uh, we usually present the finalist more quickly. Uh, we present slightly fewer, fractionally fewer candidates per hire. And underrepresented groups or minority groups are um, uh, we, the proportion of those hires is slightly stronger as well, and we're equal when it comes to uh, hires of uh, female hires or women hires across the data set. Now, it's unfair because we don't necessarily give equal searches to search firms. Sometimes people give much more difficult searches to search firms, so it's not entirely fair, but just I'd like to look at that anyway. Conscious of my time here, so I did ask, I did mention, I should say, what top performing means or ask about that, and it really is difficult to answer, and uh, I know we're going to hear from Katie and Becky and they'll tell us all about what top performing means, uh, no question. At the same time, uh, the reason I have trouble is because some organizations are amazing at talent management, succession, uh, working with their internal talent movement teams, and uh, yet they may not be so good at really understanding the external talent market and really understanding uh, what's going on with the leadership outside of their organization. And so some, again, I really say this because some organizations, uh, whatever is important to them, they focus on address and so on. And we have organizations which have, you know, teams of 30, 40, 50, or 100 plus just focus on corporate executive recruiting. And some teams and organizations which are just starting out and they are literally, they have one person and they're trying to figure out how to build this function. All of those have got amazing um, opportunities, but also they're top performing in their own ways. Uh, some are focusing in a different way in reporting. Uh, and not just reporting on some of the basic uh, data sets that we looked at earlier, uh, not just things like time to fill and so on, but uh, competitive analysis. And organizations are looking at their critical talent gaps and reporting against those only, uh, for instance, uh, or doing an amazing job of assessment. As I mentioned, we've had a panel recently on assessment and um, uh, there are some striking organizations who are doing fantastic things when it comes to assessment. Anyway, so, I could go on and on, but I want to make sure that I leave enough time uh, for Katie and Becky uh, to cover a lot of those top performing ideas and areas, actually. Um, so if there's anything, uh, we'll talk about Q&A, I think, whenever Natasha lets me. Um, but if there's anything you want to ask me personally or directly, uh, there's my details there, simon at e6.org uh, or our e6.org website. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. That was a whirlwind of data. A lot of great data there. So I can, I can imagine why you didn't want to do that at two o'clock in the morning your time. So, <laughs> But no, it was really insightful. And we, we have had um, one question come through. So if anyone's got any further questions um, as it goes on um, and as uh, Becky and uh, Katie do their presentation as well, do feel free to just pop it in and we'll, um, and we'll ask it at the end. But um, Simon, I'm just going to Oh, there you go. Um, so, Becky and Katie, I think you guys are, are still on mute at the moment, but I will hand over um, to you both. Uh, I'll just make sure, Becky, that you um, were able to get your screen up. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. I'll leave you guys to it. Hey. Hi, everyone. Um, 
My name is Rebecca Foden and I work for Transport for London and today I have Katie Charteris with me who's also working in my team and um, there's there's that 66 percent of us here today so Darren's actually um, he's actually in furlough at the moment so we've definitely been impacted um, by Covid so um, so apologies for, for not him being um, here but hopefully we'll give a good account of what we've been doing over the last um, five or six years in terms of um, trying to become a high performing in-house um, executive um, search team. So yeah, Katie, do you want to say hi? <laughs> yeah, hi everyone, great to be here. Um, Becky's going to go through the first kind of half of the slides and then I will go through the remaining slides. Cool. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to manage myself, so I'm going to put my stopwatch on um, because we've got quite a lot to go through and um, and, it, and I appreciate that there are lots of um, questions and, and points of interest that people are interested in, so hopefully we'll be able to cover off um, the majority of, of those topics. Um, if you are interested in hearing anything else about what we're covering today, then please you know, do reach out to us as we're very happy to share and best practice. So um, in terms of um, the team, um, we are a small and mighty team, there's three of us. Um, so um, so uh, in terms of the journey, it's been an incredible journey. We started off in 2014 and today um, compared to 2014, the function is totally unrecognisable. Initially, it was just me um, reacting um, reactively to roles and it was a very much a high cost, low value function very much team with the wild west of leaders just going off and, and executing searches with search firms, costs out of control, no um, qualitative or quantitative data, and there was absolutely no focus on diversity. Um, to where we are today is that we're an award-winning team, and we call ourselves, as I mentioned, the small and mighty team. And we act very much, as, which is what we want to cover off today. It's not about what we do, but much more about how we do things, and, and really to help share our knowledge, and, and ultimately, what we'd like to see is, is more organisations out there trying to create this diverse pipeline of leadership because ultimately we'll all benefit um, across the industry. So we see ourselves as chief relationship managers, recruitment architects and also talent advisors. So we report into uh, the director of talent and very much integrated um, into the talent um, strategy across Transport for London and moving much more towards the, um, the hybrid model and also um, thinking about succession planning as well. So we moved away from the staffing function um, about um, 12 months ago. We look after the top 1% of roles um, across TfL and generally it's three layers um, from the CEO and we are the world's largest transport um, authority. We also need to represent the city that we serve so a big focus of everything we do is about um, diversity so that's going to be um, you know, quite a, a focus um, in terms of what I'm going to cover um, today. So in terms of um, the remit of what um, we we actually um, look after, we can see our EVP model here and actually um, all of the strands of um, our main accountability. Um, fundamentally, we're trying to build a better London. So it's finding talent um, like this. We need a really brave talent acquisition team um, who are brave. And um, we look, so initially about 12 months ago before we actually uh, moved out of the staffing function into the um, talent acquisition function, we were probably um, responsible for just four segments um, of this actual, um, of this roundel, um, which um, focused on external market mapping. We were doing a lot of um, talent um, pipelining and executive managing executive search PSL, as well as some um, talent intelligence. But since then, the, um, our model has become much more complex, so we're much more involved in the actual internal pipeline um, development, as well as um, integrating our leadership foundation. So how do we actually grow leaders um, in the future, linking that to succession planning and also something that we haven't um, quite um, mastered yet is around the um, succession um, is around the succession planning, sorry, around the um, talent um, analytics and, um, and CRM system. Um, I'm just going to move on. Um, so there's three areas that we really cover in terms of this high idea and notion of a high performing team. And one of them um, in terms of the ingredients are the data driven aspect. So every, everything we do um, is underpinned by data and it fundamentally is um, the backbone um, of, um, of um, the team. We also um, 
are moving much more towards a talent advisory um, type service. Um, so that would be the second um, pillar. And the third pillar is actually the ability to influence the whole recruitment process and actually become very creative. So these are the three, I guess, core tenants um, that underpin everything that um, we do. Um, we, in terms of the data, you know, a lot of there's a lot of discussion around um, recruitment data metrics, and we don't really tend to look at time to offer, fill, or time to hire. We can track that. Um, but what's more interesting um, to us is um, a lot of our time is spent evaluating our internal um, talent data, applying um, you know, the traditional headhunting approach that we use internally. So we're, we're, we actually flipped ourselves inside out um, about 12 months ago as we realised that we were sitting on a huge um, talent pool of, of, of talent internally, particularly women and also um, potentially um, um, BAME um, talent as well. Um, so we are trying to, um, so you'll see um, in this, um, the bottom, um, I guess the bottom part of the grid, which is talent and succession planning and internal mobility. You can't quite see that the names there, but I, in terms of, I, I guess, um, what this is telling us is that we are looking um, to make much more um, cross um, functional promotional moves. And we're also um, trying to make more cross functional um, lateral moves. And we're pleased to say that um, last year we enabled um, 13 um, same function um, moves, um, which were promotions, and also three cross-functional um, promotional moves. And wh why is that important? Because um, actually that is actually enabling us to move talent across the large matrix um, organisation that TfL um, is, and it hopefully will enable more women actually fundamentally to get into the C-suite. Um, we know that um, men, for example, are taking much more career risks, so all the data that we're analysing um, behind um, men and application rates at Transport for London, um, as well as um, you know how um, they're moving through the organisation, organization suggests that they're actually making um, and applying for a lot more lateral um, roles. Um, so a big focus um, for my team is to really kind of look at the behaviour science um, behind um, the data and also behavior of, of, of women versus men and also um, and people from ethnic and minority backgrounds to see how we can impact um, you know more success around um, the diversity um, agenda. Um, the top um, part um, of the grid um, in terms of diversity metrics you can see that um, since 2015 to 2020 um, for women um, we've, we, we had a record year in 2017-18 in where we impacted 56% of our hiring. Um, this year, last year it was 41% but actually um, with our big focus on BAME um, BAME talent, we managed to achieve 17%. So actually our overall diversity was 51.77%. Um, now that, that figure in itself looks um, really amazing. However, um, you know, it actually only moved our workforce representation index by a, a couple of percent. Um, so if we actually look at that um, from a much more sort of holistic helicopter view around, you know, are we actually representing the diversity of London and the city um, that we're serving, we know that we need to do more um, and actually moving and um, the dial by 4%, even though we're, we're hiring well over 51% of diverse talent, is just simply not good enough. Um, so what we're trying to do is create much more movement around um, internal mobility um, and talent and really focus um, our work and effort um, coordinating with the internal um, staff, um, the staff network groups. Um, as I mentioned, um, we've noticed, uh, so we're looking at the data and then we, we really drill um, deeply into trying to, um, to gather insights into these behaviour patterns. And we thought we'd just um, share some, some, um, some, um, some insight around women, actually. We would have some data on, on BAME and I'm happy to share that um, with you with any Q&A after. But it, it's very clear that um, the average man is four times more likely to get a promotion um, than a woman. And also 41% um, of, of, of applications are men just taking career risk versus 14% women. So um, the average man will actually just um, take, um, throw their CV in, um, apply for lots of different roles and actually prepare to take lateral moves, whereas only 14% of our women were prepared to do that. Also, seven, sorry, 72% of applications are men, as I mentioned, um, prepared to take lateral moves. And also the other interesting um, um, insight is that 45 um, of our men, 45 actually leaders, um, um, male leaders, 
um, have this kind of spray and pray approach um, where they will just make multiple applications, um, generally between one and three um, over a period of 12 months, whereas um, we only have 15 women that behave in that way. Um, so what we need to do is really encourage women to make lateral moves as a conscious um, decision point um, to create um, much more leadership leadership breadth and what we're trying to do is try and change um, the behavior patterns of women and get, getting them to lean in we all know Cheryl Sandberg in terms of leaning in the lean in movement um, thinking about how they can be um, much more um, you know their brave selves and actually taking greater uh, career risk so um, we're now actually going to talk about the talent advisory um, piece. So we thought we'd, we'd share this with you as well, because um, I think this is a really great model um, to, to think about when you're trying to, to um, influence and, and build a really strong strategic partnership um, with some of, um, some of the stakeholders um, that we have. We have been testing this model now for about um, six years. And this is um, how we've ended up with a, a really strong proposition. And this model really helps us to have high quality customer focused um, conversations um, with our stakeholders. We all know that uh, managers, when we meet with them or hiring managers, they always want every moon on a stick, don't they? So they want the best candidate, um, so quality. They want it within, you know, the, seven days <laughs> um, so really unrealistic time scales and actually they, they generally don't have a budget um, so time cost quality um, is is kind of underpinning um, this model so when we sit with our stakeholders we really help them um, to understand what um, those trade-offs look like um, we um, we also, and actually moving forward, we probably could develop an algorithm on this around diversity. So cost plus time plus quality equals greater diversity. Um, the reality is that, is that if you want to achieve greater diversity, you, you have to spend time um, on the search. You have to dedicate um, some resources in terms of costs um, to the search. And also you need, um, you need to, to be focusing on the quality um, output. And if, if, you, if any of those um, you know, three um, um, principles um, are not um, as integral to the search, then you will not um, reach um, the diversity um, goals that, that you might be hoping for. Um, as I mentioned, this helps us to shape better conversations with our leaders. Um, we've got four options, and these are our sort of routes to market. Um, we always try and push for option one, um, which is the full search, internal and external. Our model is slightly more complex because we are involved in all of the internal mobility as well as um, external um, recruitment. Um, the, um, the proposition is really clear and we also make our leaders very much accountable um, for um, the example of diversity. So, for example, if, if, if diversity isn't realised and the hiring manager is just insisting on a quick um, search, um, then we would um, look to, um, to suggest option three, which is you know, a light search internal only or even option four, which is light search internal and external. And there's almost like a gamified route. Um, so we'll kind of present these questions at, at our, dis our initial discussion point um, with, with those stakeholders. Um, as I mentioned, fundamentally, we want to work on option one. The, the, the option one gives us the greatest satisfaction in our roles. Um, it helps us to be uh, much more creative and innovative in terms of finding talent, be it internally or externally. Um, and fundamentally, this, this is um, where we try and push um, the conversation. Sometimes, you know, what, what we find is that some managers are not engaged, you know, and, and fundamentally, um, we look at that from a longer term, um, um, I guess, um, state called a um, approach and um, how can we actually influence them in terms of diversity and their bias that they might have or perhaps you know they've already um, you know very much um, you know in terms of some of the cultures within TFL that they may already have um, a succession plan. Um, other managers may, may have a really really strong succession plan that's been really well calibrated um, and in which case that's a really great success story um, for us as part of the team. Um, we, in terms of the, um, the actual pushing for option one, um, so we underpin that again with our award winning model, which is um, based around core, close and creative. Um, so core means that if we go out um, with a full search internally and externally, we will uh, look um, within the, the same industry. So about 33% of the, the long list will come from, from those, um, the, those targets. Um, close means it's an aligned industry. So we'd look at another 33% of candidates coming from those and that 
would be internal or external. And then lastly, it'd be creative. And this is really where we get um, really innovative and, and really bring different talent um, to the table. And we'd, we'd suggest about 33% of that long list um, would be creative. We've got some really great examples where we've hired um, creatively. So um, very recently, um, we've got a great leader that's joined us from Coca-Cola. Um, and also um, she um, she's um, the director of um, ER and HR business partnering. And um, we've also just hired um, a great leader um, as a director of corporate um, finance um, within um, from Marks and Spencers. Um, so again, the, these um, creative um, um, backgrounds really ensures that we're offering a really, um, I guess, not only diversity, but also diversity of thought, because actually we've, we're sitting on quite a lot of talent within Transport for London that come from the core discipline. So many of our leaders may have come up through um, the hierarchy or, you know, through their roles within um, Transport for London, through the well, kind of very traditional background. But actually what we're trying to do is, is, is gain some fresh thinking and, and new ideas. Um, so we'll always try and push um, for much more close and creative um, um, candidates. You'll also see some examples as well on the side. So we, there's a couple of long lists. So there's a we play a big importance on the long list. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, you'll only arrive at a, a great shortlist of diverse candidates if you have a great long list. Um, so, we strive um, to achieve, you know, generally at least sort of fifty percent more of our candidates are actually um, women or from BAME backgrounds. Um, within the PMO um, directed long list, that was pretty challenging because it's a scarce skills market. Um, but we still achieved over you know thirty um, thirty five percent, which is actually um, pretty pretty um, pretty um, uh, amazing actually, given um, the actual um, market and background. Um, our eyes are always on the um, internal pipeline of talent. So last year, as I mentioned, um, we flipped ourselves inside out um, as we realised that we were sitting on this great talent pool. And you can see this is the, the pathway um, of, of talent, you know, that come into TfL, um, particularly focusing on women in vain. So, you know, we've got great talent pools within the customer service assistants and also um, within the early careers, so grads and apprentices, right through to, um, to um, you know, where we sit at the, at the um, at the, the, um, the end of the pipeline, which is, um, you know, in, in the leadership space. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is to really influence this forgotten middle. And there's a really um, great um, TED, TED talk um, about this, actually. Um, so we are always reaching um, you know, out to our staff network groups. So we work um, really closely with the women's staff network group. And we we ran a number of events last year. Unfortunately, a few of these events have, have actually been halted this year because of COVID. Um, but the events last year were extremely successful. We impacted um, over, I would say, well over a thousand women. Um, so the events focused on, um, you know, hashtag brand fit, um, project you and also women take charge, where we were inviting women to participate, um, giving them CV workshops, giving them advice in terms of career advice and, 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 also, um, and also management. We've also um, recently extended this out to our race group, which is our raising um, awareness um, for people with um, ethnic minority, um, cultural and ethnic minorities. It's just recently been rebranded under race. Um, so we're trying to deploy the same approach within our WSNG with the race group, as we need to do a lot more um, with um, BAME talent. Um, just to mention that with um, BAME talent, we know that um, you know, an average BAME um, candidate in, for elite, in a leadership um, space will be making between four to 18 applications um, versus you know one to three that an, an average white person would make and actually we only have eight percent BAME um, in terms of our leadership roles so there's just a lot more that needs to be done around this whole BAME pipeline so this is something we haven't solved yet um, but we are definitely starting um, those conversations and trying to impact um, that that BAME, um, the BAME pipeline. Um, so in terms of um, the, I guess, our strategic aim, so we know that, um, as I mentioned, we we have a diversity goals that we're working towards and also ultimately it's to impact the um, WRI, which is our Workforce Representation Index, which fundamentally is how we actually represent London. So London has 50% economic um, active women. Um, what we know that um, is that over the last um, um, six years, 
we have been able to recruit year on year, you know, more and more women. Um, so, you know, last year it was 45% women internally. Um, we actually managed to hire 56% women um, in two, um, 2016. However, our WRI is, is actually um, not moving um, the needle fast enough. In fact, it's going to take us between 20 and 50 years because as we actually bring people in, there are women that are exiting. Um, so actually it kind of, um, you know, puts us back to, to square one. So what we've been doing um, is um, working with our HR, strategic HR hub and also business partnering community on long term succession plans and also um, flight risk. And what we what will be an output from that will be anticipated um, roles and also flight risk roles, whereby my team will work um, much more um, kind of proactively around um, those roles that will be coming available. That will provide a change uh, in terms of the, the, I guess, the type of work that we might get involved in the team. And it will mean that we will work on really the critical roles. So the, the critical roles are up here. Um, in this kind of grid um, which is based on the strategic impact and, and role complexity and that's kind of really where we want to be um, because that really focuses and, and crystallizes our attention on that idea of option one which is the external full um, and internal full search that's kind of where we really gets us excited it gets us really engaged with talent rather than kind of moving um, people around internally that may already be a fate to complete or actually that you know um, um, you know, that um, we may not um, be able to be as, as creative with. This is just an example here. These, those names are um, anonymous, um, but we thought we'd just share with you in terms of what, what that actually um, might look like um, for the future. So I'm now going to just hand you over to Katie. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, so recruiting for senior leaders, we, we know that actually softer skills play much more of a part in what we look for these days. And I think actually the same can be applied to um, in-house exec search teams. And, um, and we kind of apply this chart to ourselves. Um, so on the left, we've kind of got this, the blended skill set that we think is critical to, to um, an in-house executive search team. And then on the right, as Becky said a couple of times, we're a brave team and we really like to embrace that um, and let our stakeholders know that we're brave and um, we're open to, to do new things when we're recruiting for roles. So everything that we do, all of the roles that we work on, obviously have to come back to our organisational values. Um, and we live through those through our um, search campaigns. Um, and I think a word that's used a lot, especially during the minute, um, at the minute, um, with lots of change happening, obviously we're living in a bit of an uncertain world at the minute, is um, having resilience. And I definitely think that's um, something that you, you need to kind of have and embrace in an in-house executive search team um, alongside some of the others. Um, so I'll just pick out a few um, and then over the next slide, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, we, we'd like to share some examples and case studies with you of how we've kind of used these to our advantage to achieving the great uh, diversity of results that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, so chief storyteller, I think both internally and externally, um, with your candidates and stakeholders or hiring managers. Um, some of you um, listening today may also uh, work for um, kind of worldwide recognised brands like TFL, but um, when you talk to candidates, you probably have the same challenge that we have in that um, there's a lot of preconceptions out there about what people think it's like to work for the organisation. Um, and your job really as an in-house search function is to know your organisation inside out and know what your kind of USPs as an organisation are. So just as a small example, you know, TFL obviously run the Tube Network. Everybody knows that. Lots of people that probably live or commute or come into London for meetings use use the services but what a lot of people don't know is that we have um, one of the biggest advertising estates we have a lot of property that we own and rent and develop we have a international consulting arm um, and we also regulate things like the type uh, the taxi and private hire trade so being a chief storyteller you have to fill in lots of the gaps and i think that's really important for getting the right candidates and really making sure that the people that you're speaking to for the roles um, know actually the, the bigger picture and not just what they think they know. Um, write and engage in content. Um, so in terms of engaging ad copy to make sure you really get across the organisation, that's something that we spend a lot of time on. Um, we, we do that in-house because we feel we're an advantage 
through knowing our stakeholders and, and their divisions, um, we're in a really great place to actually write that for them, obviously with their sign off. Um, also writing great content for LinkedIn to share, to grow organic followers um, and also sponsored posts. So we know that we're targeting um, the right audiences that we want to put the roles in front of. Um, being a thought leader, I think is really, really important. We const we're constantly pestering our um, stakeholders to be more engaging and active and visible on um, their social media channels. So predominantly LinkedIn um, as a professional network. So that's what we try and embrace and lead by example on as well. Um, and really trying to share what's authentic to us and what, what, um, what our passions and interests are and linking that back to um, the organisation that we work for. Um, TA educa educator and champion. I think this is really important because, especially if you're a, you're you're just forming an in-house function and your um, your leaders think that you're just going to go to a search firm or you're just going to deliver on a really great role, which you are, but you 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 kind of have to give that background and actually let them know how much work and um, hard work goes into that. And that's what we're we're doing by. Um, having a much more of a data driven approach um, to show the data and insights of not just what we're doing in terms of the long list, but, but how we're going about our search strategy and also what bodies that we're part of. So, for example, ethics and, and sharing those um, benchmark surveys. Um, and we will come on to um, creative event planner in the next slide. Um, so how we're creative. Um, we, so, so to use um, an example, we had um, four roles recently within finance, um, a mix of permanent interim roles, and we sat down with our leaders and really had a good chat about how we were going to go about recruiting and, and what our kind of go-to market strategy was going to be. Um, so we, um, we actually didn't just use a kind of one-size-fits-all approach and probably should have said that in the last slide. So each of our campaigns and, and each of our um, roles that we recruit for, we, we, um, we go about in a slightly different ways. So we, we don't think that there's a, a one size fits all um, approach. So it lets us be much more creative and that's something that we test out with different leaders. Some are more open to it, some not so much. So we, we have work to do with those ones. Um, but our finance leaders are, are really open to being creative and that's how we got such good um, diversity results and made some really great hires through um, the creative ad copy that we wrote, um, referrals, so using our um, senior stakeholders networks, especially those that have just joined or, or joined very recently, and also using our strategic partners such as agencies. So as Becky said, we're a small team um, and we had a mix of permanent and um, interim roles to fill. So uh, we went to our trusted um, partners that we um, use for some interim hires um, because they live through our values as well. Um, we also held a speed networking event. It was our first ever speed networking event. Um, got the buy-in from our senior leaders and was attended by um, 11 external candidates um, that were from creative industries, so things like retail. Um, and there was a couple from airlines as well and got our leaders not only from from finance but we had our talent director there and we also had our head of HR there for the professional services um, that looks after finance so we had um, a really great um, really great attendees the feedback was really positive from the attendees and from our stakeholders um, and it meant that we created a really diverse pipeline um, for the next kind of round of recruitment because actually we've seen attrition go up slightly um, so we're constantly kind of looking out for that next finance director or next head of finance um, and having the pipeline to, to back that up and not to not just be a reactive search, but to be more of a proactive search as well. So next slide, please, Becky. Um, yeah, so, um, oops, hang on. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so lastly, just to come on to leaders, leadership pledge, um, We've noticed that the best hires that we've made have had um, really great commitment from our senior stakeholders. And I, I think this is a really, really important piece um, because you are recruiting for their teams, for their leadership teams. And what we try and do in our team is have those conversations really on to let our senior stakeholders know that to get a really great hire, it's a marathon and it's not a sprint. And we really need their commitment and buy-in and time most importantly to get that. 
Um, so we um, like to have a really clear job description. I don't know about you guys listening, but we often find that we go to a stakeholder and they, we say, you know, what, what kind of thing are you looking for? And they say, don't really know at the minute. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're starting off on a really um, not, not a great place. Um, so we really, really try and work with our stakeholders to define their requirements and help as much as we can, but also um, I guess you, you kind of need that steer from them as well. Um, but so kind of defining their need and helping them shape that with the data and insights that we gain from, um, from the industry and, and roles that we've recruited for in their, you know, perhaps in their areas, but perhaps in other areas. Um, preparing the ground. So as I said, or just touched on very briefly, we really like to encourage our leaders to be visible on, um, on LinkedIn and internally on Yammer. Um, making themselves available for fireside chat. So again, we're very honest um, in saying, um, if we want to make a diverse hire, which we, you know, that's our aim for every single role, um, we need to put time into this. And you, you, you perhaps, Mr. or Mrs. Hire Manager, may need to spend a bit more time talking to candidates you may not have thought might be suitable before. Um, and getting ready, so um, making sure that again, they have put the time in for running events, internal or external, or both perhaps, if we're going with option one, um, and um, having any budget, because we don't have a big budget actually <laughs> in our team, so a lot of the stuff that we do is is usually um, internally uh, with no budget, so if they do really want to um, to spend money on a, on a campaign, um, what that looks like, what kind of budget they have. Um, so I think that's it. I think we're a bit over time, so I don't want to say too much more, just if we have any questions. Um. Excellent. Thank you very much, Katie and Rebecca. That was, uh, that was really great and, and really insightful. I know that you guys do a huge amount of work and you could probably have uh, spoken for a lot longer as well, but um, yeah, really brilliant. Um, session. So thank you very much. We are very nearly at time. Um, I am going to pose the questions though, so if everyone can sort of stay on for the next five minutes, hopefully we can whiz through those quickly. Um, just whilst you guys are, um, are, are, are doing that, um, I am just going to ask you to um, provide a little bit of feedback as well. So I'm just launching a poll, it will probably pop up on your screen. Um, so I'll just leave that running. The results won't be shared um, now, but I will be able to go through the questions um, with you um, lovely speakers now. So very, uh, very quickly, Rebecca, what was the TED talk that you mentioned? So I can share it with you. It's, um, there's a TED talk um, called The Forgotten Middle. If you, if you do a, um, a TED talk search, it's literally called The Forgotten Middle and it's inspiring actually. And it talks about, you know, a couple of people in the middle will win a lottery ticket Right. And I would say that I'm one of those. I, I was definitely in the forgotten middle. Um, I don't come from a you know, typical background um, in terms of, you know, I guess where I, where I ended up today. And so what, we're, what we recognise is that there's a lot of great talent in the middle <laughs> and yeah. there are many barriers that they face. And it could be barriers such as confidence. Um, it could be it could be caring responsibilities. It could just generally be that they're actually reporting um, to the wrong person or they're in the wrong role um, and they just need a, a bit of direction. So we've been spending a lot of time engaging with those um, women, actually, and, and, and actually there's intersectionality because there's women and being people within the Staff Network group. Um, and we're trying to get them to, to really um, build that com inner confidence. And we have a, um, we have a career management um, kind of career innovation lab it's it's um it's called project you and it's the six steps to success and we are really holding them accountable for their own career as um, their own career management so we actually help them and guide them and we're seeing some really great positive um results so some of our women are reporting that they're getting um promotional moves and they're actually taking more career risk and actually um it's it's, it's at every meeting um that we stage the next meeting is is actually much more of a proactive meeting where we're actually asking them to, to participate more so we're actually seeing them come out of their comfort zone so yes yeah, so the forgotten middle I think is a really um, great TED talk but I, I would really um, I, I guess I guess a key recommendation is to really think about your own organizations and if you have uh, staff network groups or employee resource groups is to link um, into those groups um, we actually 
It, actually, last year we, we impacted 20% of the events actually within the Women's Self Network Group, which is amazing. And what we wanted to do this year was actually measure through surveys the impact of the engagement that we had to date. So through through confidence um, building and whether they actually had applied for roles and, and actually what were the outcomes. So so this year was going to look uh, slightly different. We were knocked off orbit a little bit, um, but we're hoping to, um, to get that back. Um, where we all? Everyone was knocked off orbit a little yeah, bit, weren't they, this exactly. year? Um, Becky, I'm just going to um, thank you for answering that question. We have got a few others that would be good to just um, get through quickly. So um, perhaps, um, Simon, to, um, to yourself, and this was a question, do you know what the difference in the attrition rate between hires from internal and external executive teams um, was? Did you have any data on that at all? Yeah, that's a, yeah, thanks for the ask. Um, and uh, no. <laughs> that so, was a quick uh, answer. <laughs> yeah, we don't ask, we don't ask that question. It's a great question, and we would hope that our members or respondents would ask that question of their own data or their own yeah. set. Um, but we don't ask that question. I can connect. That's a great question, seriously, and I'd love to. I'd love to know the answer. So I can connect whomever that is with people who might know, because I know that people do ask and assess the source of hire, and mm. probably go deeper. So if they wanted to, I can probably connect with people who might know better. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Katie, there was another one around attrition rates as well, actually. So how do you monitor attrition rate of new starters when there could be lots of different elements that can affect the experience within their first 90 days, such as, you know, their job description not being quite what it was, not liking people in the team? Um, yeah. how, how do you guys monitor that and, and gather that data? Uh, manually <laughs> is the answer for now. Uh, we, we actually don't have a CRM system. It, it's something that we would really like to implement, but we... Mm we actually focus um, our data manually and we use things like LinkedIn um, because mm -hmm. we have our internal, so we have our internal talent data, uh, which we base on the nine box grid. And um, we, we kind of do quite a lot of analysis on, on how long our leaders are staying in roles, how long it's taken them to move um, either laterally or promotionally within the organization. And actually mm -hmm. if they're not getting that, promotion or lateral move internally are they moving so how so we, we we've just done a bit of a piece of work actually on on this um we're also focusing on um the first 100 days it's it's part of a bigger piece of work called the leadership foundation which yeah. sits with our colleagues in organizational design and development um and what we would like to implement more of when we have more technology um our stay interviews so actually we we're keeping that um, conversation open with our with our new employees um, and actually checking in with them um, from a talent perspective to see you know you know as you said is the role what you thought it would be um, mm -hmm. are there any challenges that you're really struggling to overcome do you need any additional support um, so it's it's something that we haven't nailed yet but it's it's going to be a focus definitely it already is a focus and it will continue to be a focus